All right, you might as well just start it. It's, I just started it, yeah. By the way, the, um, I noticed that the, the YouTube videos aren't as sharp as they could be. That is to say, the camera makes a better image than we see on YouTube. Does anybody know if there's some incantation or something that one needs to click on when uploading to YouTube that uh, tells YouTube to use a less lossy uh, storage? All right. I just thought you, know, you guys know some things I don't know. YouTube obviously doesn't want to store more than it has to. So that's what it does. So maybe I should start with um, by asking um, whether somebody has a question about what we did last time, because of course it was um, uh, it was one of the most detailed, technically detailed. Uh, things that we're going to cover this semester. So, is there anything that any question about last time? Okay, I I've updated back this afternoon. I updated those notes. Um, so, what we basically got to um, was. I'm not quite sure where I stopped last time, but roughly speaking, let's see, can, can somebody raise the, more daylight is better than less daylight. Oh yeah, let's turn that off. Brilliant. Okay, you guys get candy. Who else did the, you did that? No. Check out how that. Who? Check out. All right. Thanks. Okay. So what we came up with um, basically was this: the sum on sigma bar. By the way, I'm uh, at making a transition from sigma to s. I mean, it's just Weinberg has some fondness for Greek letters that I think is. I think it's a mistake. A is a translation, not an annihilation. I'll, I'll keep sigma for the moment. Well, maybe I'll try to make the trans. No, I better not. There are too many indices here. And I'm trying to transition from Greek to Roman. Okay, so the first thing we do is we um, consider just a translation. So 
from no Lawrence um, transformation at all. And then these equations vastly simplify, and they just turn into, so in other words, both d's are equal to 1, it's equal to the identity. So d sigma bar sigma is just delta sigma bar sigma, d l bar l is just delta l bar l. And then what we have is ul of a semicolon p and sigma is ul of 0 p sigma e to the i p dot a, because when there's no, when lambda is just the identity, this is just p dot a. And the other one for the uh, other spinner so it looks like that and so what this tells us is that the space dependence or the space time dependence of the spinners is just a phase factor so that means then that ul of um, x, p, e and sigma uh, is just um, 2 pi to the minus 3 halves ul of p and sigma e to the i p dot x and vl of x, p, and sigma is 2 pi to the minus 3 halves VL P sigma to the minus I P dot X. And the two pi's are just conventional. Um, that means that the fields are free transforms, so psi plus L of X is I'm gonna write it slightly differently. Sum on sigma integral dq p over 2 pi to the 3 halves. E to the i p dot x, ul of p and sigma, a of p and sigma, and of course you know al of p. No, there's no al of p of sigma. It's al, a of p and sigma and psi minus L of x sum on sigma integral dqp 2 pi to the 3 halves e to the minus i p dot x vl of p and sigma um, e dagger of p and sigma. Now, um, We could, of course, in fact, probably I should have been doing all of this. Um, I thought that by dropping the index in that Weinberg carries, um, that I would have to introduce, and I would have to consider antiparticles from the beginning. Um, but I think actually in retrospect that um, that's really not necessary. We could, if you want, imagine that, all the, that, 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 that there's only one kind of neutral particle here and um, the B's are just the same as the A's. So if you want, you can um, set B to A at this point. <coughs> or at some earlier point. In other words, we don't really need to make that distinction um, yet. Um, on the other hand, the, the spinners are different because they satisfy different rules. The B spinners satisfy this rule. And the difference, there are two differences. One, of course, is there's a minus sign there, and the other is it's a complex conjugation here. So those are basically Hey, uh, Kevin. So are these A's next to it? So in the bottom equations, you have A and B. 
that a that's that's an annihilation operator, and we're not it's not a translation anymore. Yeah, I it, mean, it, if we could, uh, this a of course is a displacement. Yeah, this but is, in the bottom, in the one below that, the a is a. Well, and this is an annihilation operator. We could make this just a dagger. Okay. In fact, it probably is. It probably makes sense to do that. So, but I will. In other words, let's not be more general than we need to be at this stage. I have a question. Good. Yeah. Well, I see he gets a candy. Now. Can you give an example of like a time when like all the because so essentially what we're doing is is we're constructing field operators such that they transform properly under translations. When is the time that we only need to consider translations? Like like here we haven't put on any constraints about rotations or boosts. Right. Right? So when is the time that like we want to create a field operator such that all we care about is how it transforms under translations? Well, let's put let's say suppose you were in a world that was one dimensional. Well, even if it was one-dimensional, you'd have to consider boosts. You mean one plus one-dimensional? Yeah, 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 yeah. Sure. So the simplest quantum field theory would be at one plus one dimensions, and there you'd have to have boosts. But I guess, I don't know, a non-relativistic quantum field theory, that's, I mean, would that, would that suffice? not have to consider boosts? Uh, well, if, even if you're non-relativistic, you'd want things to behave properly under rotations. Oh, well, if it's one-dimensional, right, you don't have rotations. Well, but even, so in three dimensions, I, I don't, maybe I'm misunderstanding what you yeah. Are you asking, like, so what if you have two observers moving at the same velocity but in different locations? Then that would be a translation. And so this is this would transform so that they would both observe the same physical results. Okay. I think, is that what sure. you're asking? Yeah, I'm. Yeah, I guess I'm just. I guess I'm asking like, 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 what's like the like when physically do we only care about these translations and well, not have to worry right, about let, rotations? Let me let me or, turn your let me turn your so question. That's sort of, let me turn your question around. Okay. What Weinberg is trying to do is to find out what the spinners are so that he can do calculations. Okay. Because if you just have arbitrary, if the spinners are arbitrary functions, uh, that they depend arbitrarily on an index L, a space-time position, a momentum, and a sigma, um, you know, you can't do any actual calculations. You're going to have to know exactly what those spinners are. Mm. And so he's using the requirement that fields transform properly under Lorentz transform, under Poincaré transformations to derive the spinners for arbitrary fields. Spin zero, spin one half, spin one, spin three halves, whatever. Sure. So that's the that's the thing he's doing. And he was the first, as far as I know, to do that. He did it in some FizRev articles back in 63, 64, something like that. He was at, he was at Berkeley then. So that's the, that's the idea. And of course, what this means is the field of Fourier transforms. Of each other? Well, no, I'm thinking of them. I mean, they might be Fourier transform. No, they're not Fourier transforms each other either. But the field, this is the annihilation part, or the positive frequency part, negative frequency part. This thing is psi, psi of x, the Fourier transform of uh, the momentum space. That's all. Uh, the, 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 that's, that's all it is. Okay. Um, 
One conclusion of this is that all the fields, whatever their spin, mass, whatever, they always obey applying Gordon equation, namely graph squared minus d0 squared minus m squared on psi L of x is equal to zero. This is often written as box minus m squared psi L of x equals zero. So the klein gordon equation is automatically satisfied no matter what the spin is. Um, So now our conditions up here are somewhat simpler. And these are the conditions to which we'll apply, uh, which, which we'll look at in the case of boosts and rotation. So these conditions are sum sigma bar UL of lambda P sigma bar d sigma bar sigma of j of w of lambda d is square root of lambda, oh, that's p0, over lambda p0, so on l d L bar L of lambda and L of P and sigma. And then the other equation is sum on sigma bar B L bar lambda P sigma bar B star J sigma bar sigma W lambda P square root of P zero or lambda P zero, sum L D L bar L of lambda B L P sigma. Okay. So you notice now in this form, the right hand sides are essentially identical and the only change is you go from um, the annihilation part to the creation part is you have a complex conjugation. Okay, so the first case. So, so did you drop the x just because it's not necessarily relevant here? You drop the x because um, what we what we've got is. Uh, Well, let's see. I actually didn't bother to go through this in detail. What, what we're saying here is that um, we know what this is. This thing is just a phase factor times u of lambda bar of lambda p and sigma. And the phase factor would be e to the i in other words, this, this thing here is e to the i lambda x plus a, or actually dot lambda p, because this is lambda p, on that side. And then on the other side, we have e to the i lambda p dot a. So that part cancels. And then this, this thing is x and p. This is e to the i x dot p. And now I'm ah, ah. This still works because these are equal. Why are these equal? Because under a Lorentz transformation, lambda x dot lambda p is the same as x dot p. So these things, so those terms all cancel on both sides and they go away. So that was a good question. Yeah, and so you knew that because you were, you're sort of working on, you already gave me candy for the question. Huh? You already gave me candy for the question. You don't want any more? Yeah, it's fine. 
Uh, no, and so, and so you knew that because you're sort of working off of what you just did for pure translations. Is that what's going yeah, on? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, would obviously, we, okay. we have this, we argue about translations, and we go to there. But, but the way we go to there actually is to cancel this on both sides. Okay, I see. And um, that's a good point. I just sloughed over it when I was late taking the notes here. Um, it just, I, I focused on the fact that the fields always obey the kind of order. Mm -hmm. So if I can put a note here to it. Um, okay, now let's go to the case of boosts. You might say, let's go first to the case of rotations. It's actually the boosts that are easier to think about. So what we do is we set, for simplicity, P equal K equal M0. And then we set lambda equal to L of Q, where L of Q on K is um, Q. Well, it would have to be, wouldn't it? And um, L of P is just 1 because P is K. So then, the Wigner rotation is W of lambda P is L inverse of lambda P, lambda L of P. Well, L of P is 1, lambda is L of Q, so this is L inverse of L of Q. Now, what's lambda P? Well, lambda P is um, lambda p is L of q on p, which is k, and that's q. So lambda p is q, so this is L inverse of q, and so this is just 1. So the Wigner rotation is just not a rotation at all, it's just the identity matrix. Wait, why is LP equal 1? Why is L, L of P equal to 1? Because P is equal to K. Okay. So in other words, so L, L of K. P on K is equal to P, but this is equal to K, so okay. L of P is 1. Okay. Why did you say? But K is only one dimension. Huh? K has only one dimension. Can we, but there is a big Well, case. we're imagining we're boosting in some arbitrary, or some, uh, some arbitrary direction. Why well, we can see there is? Huh? Why well, we can see LP is one? Um, well, because we're saying that we're choosing P equal to K for simplicity. K is M0. We're setting P equal to K. The definition of L of P is that it takes K into P. But if P is equal to K, then it's just one. Okay, so you get a candy, and somebody else has to. You guys are going to be selling these. Oh, that's a great catch. That would be a great catch. Okay. All right. So, what are the what do these equations become then in this case? All right. So they become simpler. What is um. Lambda P, um, well, lambda P is just Q, so this, this top equation is sum on sigma bar UL of Q sigma bar DJ sigma bar sigma. Oh, but this is just one, so this is. This is delta sigma sigma bar. So this is just UL of Q and sigma. And now on the right hand side we have this. And that is square root of M over Q0. A sum on L of D L bar L 
of L of Q, U L, P is just zero and sigma. P here is really three vector P. I've just been slopping and writing it as P. But um, well, it could be four vector. It really doesn't matter. But the point is that it. When you're setting p equal to this thing equal to k, then it's nice to write it as zero rather than k. The second equation becomes, for a similar reason, this is just delta, so this becomes vl of um, there's no bar here vl of uh, q and sigma is square root of m over q0 sum on l dl bar l l of q vl of 0 and sigma. Okay, so that's what we found uh, for applying the boosting. So what does this say? This says that the spinner at arbitrary form momentum is this ratio of energies times simply a Lorentz transformation on the spinner at zero. And that's, um, that's exactly, that's the nicest thing that we could possibly have. And it is this nice and this simple uh, for two reasons. One is that we're considering ma the massive case. And secondly, that we chose to define the standard Lorentz transformation and the Wigner rotations carefully so that it would turn out that we have the same sigma here as we have there. And that makes the, that makes the notation a lot simpler. Now the next thing is rotations. Um, yeah. The last equation is that d is that d star for v. No, that's just d. Remember, if we go over here, the star occurs on the ah, right. okay. on the on the effect the rotation matrices. Because remember, w is just a rotation. See, that's the clever thing about the Wigner rotation. When you throw things back and make them a rotation, then you have this simple representation of the rotations. And um, for any spin, there's a natural rotation group, and that's the stuff you study in quantum mechanics. Also, the, I put the chapter on a PDF of the chap, my, a chapter from my book on group theory is on the web paper, and uh, you, can, you can look at, at it. Um, I talk about the rotation group there. Okay, so now let's go back to, in fact, to these conditions up here. and consider the case of uh, rotations. And so now we're going to um, consider rotations as opposed to boosts. So we're, we're, we're once again, for simplicity, we're going to set P to the K, which of course is M0. And we're going to set lambda equal to R. Well, you remember when lambda is R, the Wigner rotation is just uh, R itself. So W is equal to R. So we went through that um, uh, for the massive case, which is what we're considering, a um, week before last. 
So now these conditions up there uh, become B, sigma bar, U, L bar, at zero, sigma bar, EJ, sigma bar, sigma of R equals sum over the Lorentz index L, DL bar L of R, UL of zero and sigma and some sigma bar VL bar of zero and sigma bar D star J sigma bar sigma of R is a sum on L DL bar L of R VL is zero and sigma. Okay. And these DJs, these things are two J plus one by two J plus one dimensional square unitary. Representations of the rotation group. In particular, DJ I think I'm going to make the transition to S. S prime S of theta is e to the minus i theta dot JJ. Now that's a matrix, and we're talking about the S prime S component of it. And here, J A J B is I epsilon A B C J C. Here we're always in natural units, H bar and C to the one. Um, a B C go over the one to three. These are the uh, generators of the rotation group, or the Lie algebra of the rotation group, uh, of this spin J representation of the rotation group. And of course, as you know, these epsilon, A, B, C, those are epsilon, one, two, three is one, epsilon is totally anti-symmetric. These are the structure constants of the rotation group. And they're the same for all representations. And so that's what we're seeing here. J specifies the representation, spin J. And for every J, the, the structure constants are the same. Uh, by the way, I was just kind of wondering, uh, since we turned in the homework, do you have an example of this extra credit problem? Did you ever find one? Because I was never able to find one. I found some notion of Oh, um, thing, yeah, I, 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 the, the point is if you have just sort of a, it seems to me that a generic non-compact group, if you look at the representations, you wind up with some structure constants that are imaginary. That's what I, I think. But um, why don't we chat about that sometime? Uh, sure, 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 sure. Just come by my office on okay. a Monday or a Wednesday or a Friday, mm -hmm. or a Saturday or a Sunday if I'm there. But, by the way, if you want to see me, um, call first because I'm, you know, I may or may not be in my office. The phone works um, after one. Um, I'm trying to get up early. I'm trying to get up at the crack of noon, but. Um, But, um, anyway, uh, you call there because then you can see am I in my office or not. And, um, all right, so let's.
let's see, I've gotten kind of distracted. Now, what about these other matrices? Well, these other matrices are DL bar L, and these have the same form, but the generators are different because we're really talking about the rotation. The generators of the rotation part of the Lorentz group, and um, these things are somewhat different depending on what the spin is and what the representation is, but that's what we're talking about. Um, but here, in order to analyze this, you see these guys on the right-hand side are the same. So if we go to the case where we have an infinitesimal rotation, then this is just delta sigma bar sigma plus, in other words, dj is, uh, is going to be s prime s is going to be delta s prime s plus, uh, minus i theta dot j where theta is super small and the dl's dl bar l is going to be delta l bar l minus i theta dot J for theta, very, very small. Now, the, the delta part just cancels on both sides. It just says that um, UL bar of zero and sigma equals UL bar of zero and sigma, and the same thing for the Bs. So the delta part cancels in both equations. What one has left is the rest of it. And those equations then are sum on, I guess I, I switched to S's, so S prime UL bar of zero and S prime JJ S prime S is then equal to a sum on L of J L bar L U L of zero and S, but for the uh, let me call them the anti-spinners, which is what actually they turn out to be. B L bar of zero and S prime. Now we have minus. J star J S prime S equals sum L J L bar L B L of zero and S. So that's what we get as the conditions on um, the spinners for rotation. because um, the only particle physics that's actually supported by experiment basically is the standard model. And in the standard model, um, you have uh, quarks and leptons, and the quarks and leptons all have spin one half, and then there are other particles uh, that are spin one, and then you also have the Higgs field, which is spin zero. Now, uh, so the spin one half case is really important, and it's these equations that Weinberg uses in uh, a couple of sections beyond where we are now to um, derive what the Dirac spinners have to be. And um, uh, 
these two equations to show that the, uh, that the spinners are not the spinners you write down if you just um, picked your nose and um, wrote them on a wrote on a sheet of paper what you imagined they might be without actually writing them. Okay, but before we get to that, let's do the spin zero case. The spin zero case, somewhat ironic, uh, obviously it's the simplest case. And it's vastly simpler. The spin zero is vastly simpler than the um, spin one half, and that's simpler than spin one, which has all sorts of um, issues. And then beyond the spin one half, which has spin one, we have other issues. And so um, it's for pedagogical purposes, the spin zero case is, is, a, is a favorite. And what's very strange is that nature doesn't seem to like spin zero particles very much. And the only the only one that's a fundamental particle that's been discovered so far is the Higgs boson. And um, it, of course, is terribly unstable. Um, so we have, although this is the nicest field and the simplest one to analyze, it's, um, it represents a 125 GeV uh, unstable particle. And um, that's somewhat of a disappointment. What would be, what would make the study of physics simpler would be if all the fields were spin zero, or if they were all spin zero except for one or two that were spin one half, and then, then our lives intellectually would be simpler. But more about that. So spin one, spin zero fields have no spin or Lorentz indices. And so the conditions, the boost conditions just require that u of q, the square root of m over q zero, u of zero, and v of q, the square root of m over q zero, v of zero. And so these fields are phi plus well, there's no L subscript, so that's actually uh, a typo there. Psi of phi of x, and there's another typo. Well, let me fix the typos. dqt over the square root of the 2 pi cubed, that's just conventional. 2p0 is this square root here. The m we're absorbing somewhere. And this is a of p, e to the i px, and phi minus of x is then dqp square root of 2 pi cubed, 2p0, a dagger of p, e to the minus i. Okay, once again, as I said, I'm I long ago dropped the extra index n, and uh, I'm just considering a neutral field. So what we have now is we have that um, let me just make sure I haven't skipped anything. Okay. Five plus of x Adjoint is phi minus of x. In fact, plus minus is minus plus. So you just go from one to the other by taking the adjoint. Now, um, it's pretty clear here since commutation relations are a and b. A of Q, say, is just zero, that consequently 5 plus of X, 5 plus 
of y always zero whether our x and y are space-like or not. And it's also true that phi minus of x, phi minus of y is zero. On the other hand, we of course have the commutation relation A of P, a dagger of Q, minus plus. Oh, let me say minus plus, because we haven't. One of the nice things about Weinberg's treatment is that he doesn't assume that the spin zero field or the spin J field is a boson or a fermion. And what he shows in the early part of the section on scalar fields is that he basically proves spinning statistics for the spin zero case. He proves that the spin zero field has to be a boson. Yeah? So what is the minus plus outside the commutator mean? Really oh, great question. You'll get a candy for that momentarily. This is, so this is a standard notation. Oh, so it's a commutator or an anti Or the anti-commutator. Okay. And so this is delta Q of P minus Q, and there I just mean that. So that means that phi plus and phi minus aren't going to commute or anti commute very easily. And so if we now just compute this, what do we get? Well, we're going to have an integral dqp dqp prime 2 pi q square root of 2p0 2p prime 0 e b i p dot x e minus i p prime dot y and then what do we have? We have a of p a mega of p prime minus a plus. And that is going to give delta of p minus p prime. And so this is then integral dqp dqp prime 2 pi cubed square root 2 p0 p, 2 p prime 0 e to the i p dot x e to the minus i p prime dot y now this is delta Q of P minus Q. So using this commutation or anti-commutation relation, that's what we get. And now um, what you one of the things you learn when you you have a subject that has lots of Fourier transforms, and this is especially true of quantum field theory, is that the Dirac's delta function is your best friend. Um, this just, oh, this is P minus P prime. Uh, you could do the P prime integration instantly, you just said P prime equal to P, and so this gives you integral dqp over Phi cubed, 2p0, e to the i, p dot, x minus y, and that's it. Right, okay. And this is a famous function in quantum field theory. It's called capital delta sub plus of x minus y, the four vectors of x minus y.
Now, um, first of all, notice that this is a Lorentz invariant function. Why is that? Well, dqp over p0, that's Lorentz invariant. Four vector dot four vector Lorentz invariant. Uh, the whole thing's Lorentz invariant. This is Lorentz invariant. On the other hand, it's not zero, even when x and y are space-like, which leads to an interesting conclusion, namely that the spin zero field has to be a boson. And so what we do is we're going to compute delta plus, and it has to be a Hangul function. So delta plus of x then is an integral PQP, in other words, it's, 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 this thing is Lorentz invariant. So um, what we're going to do is we're going to um, we're interested in what it is when x and y are spacelike, and uh, what we're going to show is that it's not zero even when x and y are spacelike. Well, if x and y are space-like, or even if they're not, we can always go to, well, if they're space-like, we can go to a frame, well, we can always make a Lorentz transformation such that y is zero. Then we just have delta of x. And so delta plus of x is dqp over 2 pi cubed. 2 p0 is square root of p vector squared plus m squared. And what we have left is e the i p dot x. Now, um, this thing is Lorentz invariant. X is space-like. And so we can go to a frame where x0 is equal to 0. So we go to the x0 equals 0 frame to evaluate this, just to make things simpler. Then this thing is dqp. 2 pi cubed, 2 square root of p squared plus m squared. This is e to the i, length of p, length of x, cosine of the angle between them, and dqp is p squared dp 2 pi d cosine theta. Okay, this is the usual thing that you do when you are trapped in Jackson's clan in electrodynamics and the professor is banging Jackson's book over your head. This, this is um, the uh, this is what you do, and um, so now I'm going to be setting um, x equal to the length of x vector, p equal to um, the length of p vector. And so this thing then is, well first of all let's just do this d cosine beta integration d cosine theta e to the i p x cosine theta. This is equal to, and we're going from minus 1 to 1, this is equal to e to the i p x minus, minus i p x over um, i p x. And so if we divide by 2 and multiply by 2, we see that this part is the sine of p x. Whoops, I left out this. So this is 2 sine px over px. And um, so altogether then, delta plus of x is 1 over 4 pi squared x integral 0 to infinity sine px pdp 
square root of, well, it's p squared, isn't it? Plus m squared. And um, if we now set uh, p equal to mu and mu, we then uh, get that this is actually m over 4 pi squared x and x, if I go back to the original more explicit notation, it's the length of the three vector part. Integral 0 to infinity sine mxu u du over the square root of u squared plus 1 and this turns out to be m over 4 pi squared x k1 of m x vector squared. Okay, so this is a Henkel function. And the point is that it's not zero. So we've got to do something to to make we've got to do something because we want the fields to to commute or anti-commute in space-like separations because we want a theory that's Lorentz invariant and causal. Um, most folks just say causal, but um, what Weinberg argues, and we basically skipped this, but in chapter three and four, he argues that you have a Lorentz invariant S matrix only if you arrange the fields commuted space like or anti commuted space like separations and to get a Lorentz invariant S matrix. Um, also, obviously, you don't have causality unless the fields commute or anti commuted space like separations. Otherwise, um, you can have um, things happening, causal reactions faster than the speed of light. All right, let me now switch to the whiteboard. By the way, one of you pointed out that um, when I write with the red on the whiteboard, it doesn't show up in the video. And the reason, of course, is that red photons have only half the energy field of um, blue photons. And so the red photons don't do much to the camera. And uh, when Google and YouTube get finished with uh, saving on the storage. Um, the red markers almost disappear. All right. So now we come to this very interesting um, proof of the connection between spin and statistics. And what uh, Weinberg does is he says, well, let's take this scale of this spinless field and write it as a linear combination of phi plus of x plus lambda phi minus of x. And then choose kappa and lambda so that we get uh, a, um, we get that they commute or anti, that phi commutes or anti commutes with itself and with its adjoint at space-like separations. And so first of all, we look at phi of x with phi adjoint of y, and again, minus or plus. Sometimes I forget to write minus or plus. So what is this? This is then kappa phi plus of x plus lambda phi minus of x commutator or anti-commutator with kappa star phi minus of x plus lambda star phi plus of, of y. This is y, isn't it? And so what is the story? Well, phi plus commutes or anti-commutes with phi plus, that's easy. But phi plus and phi minus gives us this delta plus. So this is equal to 
absolute value of kappa squared times delta plus of x minus y. Well, let's see. I'm going a little too fast here. Let me let me let me, let me do this a little bit more slowly so that you see everything. So this is y plus of x y minus. Let's see, that's dagger, okay? By, by dagger. Oh, all right, I've got things. No, let's, let me do this for you. Phi plus phi minus of y. Then we have plus, no, it's not plus. Yeah, it is plus. Absolute value of lambda squared by minus of x commutator or anti-commutator with phi plus. I'm getting this screwed up now. Phi plus plus phi minus star phi mi minus phi plus and star. Okay. So the kappa squared is this one, which is that. Lambda squared is phi minus of x. Ah, yes, with phi plus one. That's exactly what we want. And this is minus plus. Now this one we know is delta plus. And this one is also, well, it's, it is minus, so let me, let me do this in two steps to make it clear. Minus lambda squared phi plus of y phi minus of x. And it's not what I just said, it's minus or plus that. Okay, so I'm, I'm screwing this thing up royally. In other words, if this is a commutator, then you interchange the order uh, at the price of a minus sign. If it's an anti-commutator, you can just interchange the order and nobody cares. This better be what's in the notes. Well, it was actually a mistake, but I'll fix it. Okay, now, what do we know about delta plus? Let's remember something about delta plus. It's Lorentz, oh, it, we don't need to turn the camera. Delta plus is Lorentz invariant, and um, it depends only upon the length of the, uh, of x minus y squared. In other words, it just depends upon x minus y squared. So, delta plus x minus y equals delta plus y minus x for if this is space-like, which is what we're considering. So for space-like x and y, delta plus is even. And that's the way we computed it. We just took that to be the length of x, which is x minus y, the space part of x minus y. So this thing is, let me just go through this again, kappa squared delta plus x minus y minus or plus lambda squared delta plus y minus x, which is kappa squared delta plus x minus y minus or plus lambda squared delta plus x minus y, and altogether this is kappa squared minus a plus lambda squared times delta plus of x minus y. Okay. So obviously there's an easy way to make this zero. 
You make this zero just by choosing kappa to have the same magnitude as lambda. You don't even care about the phase. What if it's the plus one? What if it's the commutator? Give me that again. If it's the commutator, then you make it zero. Yeah, both be zero, right? It's commutator or anti-commutator. Yeah, it's the anti-commutator, you can plus that, and then you make it zero. That's right. OK. Yes, yes. Brilliant point. In other words, if we had a plus sign here, and we're dealing with anti-commutators, we'd be stuck. We'd be fucked. So you need the anti, you need the commutator. So this means spin zero particles or spins uh, to, to, to be more accurate, spin zero fields describe bosons. Okay, now, for the other case, phi of x with phi of y, maybe I will flip to the other side of the board. Okay, once again, this thing, if we flip it, this is kappa lambda delta plus of x minus y, and this is minus or plus kappa lambda phi plus of y phi minus of x. And so this is kappa lambda in both cases, delta plus of x minus y, and then it's 1 minus or plus 1. So once again, if we choose the plus case, we're in bad shape. We choose the minus case, which is, say, it's a boson field, we're home free. So uh, choose minus sign, which is the choice we had in the other case, that is commutators. And um, so the field is a boson. Uh, 
Um, well, there was one other thing that I didn't emphasize on, but which was obvious to you on the other side. We also have to have the absolute value of capital of capital to be equal to the absolute value of lambda. The phases are totally arbitrary. Here they don't matter, and the magnitude doesn't even matter there. It just matters that the thing be a horizontal. Here we just um, the magnitudes don't matter, they just have to be equal. The phases are totally arbitrary, so what one does is one just sets um, kappa equal lambda equal one. And that's the end of the story, and that's how it on the field. Um, so what's this, what this has said then is that if you have a little, if you want a theory to be Lorentz invariant and uh, field theory of spin zero fields, and you want the S matrix to be uh, Lorentz invariant, then you better have the, you better use commutation relations and have the spin zero field be a boson, the particles be bosons. And um, that uh, that is well. Let me let me just go maybe one step further here. Um, what one has then is that phi of x is equal to then phi plus of x plus phi minus of x. And um, this is equivalently phi plus of x plus phi plus of x adjoint um, and so this tells you that it, it is um, What am I trying to say here? Yeah, right. This is the same thing as phi of x adjoint because phi of x adjoint would be um, phi plus of x adjoint. Well, this is... Uh, uh, well, let's just say phi plus of x ad, phi, this is phi plus plus phi minus of x, all that adjoint. Phi plus of x adjoint is phi minus of x, and phi minus of x adjoint is phi plus of x. So the field is remission. Phi of x is phi of x adjoint. Um, so it's, it's a remission spinless field, and um, uh, that's basically how that is. Now what one can do is one can imagine uh, a case where you have two kinds of, of particles of the same mass. And now let's, so, so we could then have one field phi of x would be an integral e to the i p dot x a1 of p that's phi 1 of x and then phi 2 of x well this is phi plus um, would be an integral e to the i p dot x a2 of p and then what you could do is you could take a complex linear combination of these and in fact let me let me write them as the whole field rather than so the whole field in fact that's what I should have done earlier here I should have said when you combine phi plus with phi minus you get a structure that looks like this a1 dagger of p and this to Kill the lily is EQT over square root 2 pi q 2p0. And then 
we would have the same thing here, e to the minus i, p dot x, a2 dagger of p, and uh, dqp square root 2 pi q 2 p0. So we would have then, if we had two particles of the same mass, notice the p, the relationship between p0 and 3 vector p is the same if the masses are the same. Now what we do, this is the trick that Gelman uh, invented a long time ago when he was a postdoc, I think. He took phi 1 plus i phi 2 of x and made a complex field, and I guess he divided by square root of 2. And so what does this do? This gives us something that's e to the i px a1 plus i a2 over root 2 plus e to the minus i px and now we have a1 dagger of p uh, plus i a2 dagger of p over root 2 and then dqp over the square root. Okay. Now here's what I want you to notice. This is very cute. You see, this isn't the adjoint of that. And so what you do is you call this the annihilation operator for the particle, and you say a of p is a1 of p plus i a2 of p over root 2. And this thing you call B dagger, which is a one dagger of P minus I, no, plus I, a two dagger of P over root two. Notice A dagger is not equal to B dagger. And so this then is the creation operator for the antiparticle. And B of P then is a1 of p minus i, a2 of p over root 2. So that's how you introduce antiparticles. And this trick that Gelman invented uh, a long, long time ago um, uh, is used throughout physics. You can take, uh, you can imagine that you have a neutrino that's, a, say, a neutral spin zero particle of a certain mass. You then take another neutrino of the same mass, you take a linear combination of them, or just take any spin one half or any spin anything particle of a spin mass. If you have another one of the same mass, you take complex linear combinations, you then have a complex field that has antiparticles. And, um, when you then couple these to electromagnetism, you automatically have a case where two photons can produce particle antiparticle. We'll see that later. All right. I think that if there's no more questions, if there are no more questions, I guess we can turn it off, and I'll tell you the story.